Bom dia, mais e mais, eu sou o Rai, mais a gata este ato. Qual com mais? Very briefly. I want to come to welcome you to this event and as well as the the those uh, that are following this event uh, online. So I want to welcome you to all which uh, to this event, which you, you can already suppose that is a much loved event for us. Uh, for two reasons, at least. First one, because we salute what our Irish friends have achieved with the official status of their language. And secondly, because we want to continue to claim here in the heart of Europe, the official status for our language, Catalan, which despite being the 13th most spoken language in the European Union, it has not yet become official, as you all know. And having said that, I give the floor to our Minister of Just Justice of the Government of Catalonia, Lourdes Tiro. Good morning, Minister, Mr. Hicks, delegates, and everyone here today. Welcome to this event. Bon dia, here Grish Air Machin. First of all, I would like to congratulate the Gaelic language community on their achievement of getting the European Union to approve full official status of their language in European institutions, both for what this entails in terms of acknowledgement and respect, and also the rights and benefits it will bring. Uh, this institutional recognition is a further milestone in the support and protection of this language, a new tool to safeguard the language rights of the 200,000 people who speak Gaelic. This is a very good news and also a much needed step. Yet it is clear to all of us that this alone is not enough. States and institutions set up regulatory frameworks to protect languages and promote their use. However, if there is no community which speaks it and uses it on a daily basis for which is a common language, then the language is unlikely to survive. Needless to say, we are absolutely delighted that Gaelic, which like Catalan has been persecuted and stigmatized, has gained this status undoubtedly make easier by having its own state. It is a language that also faces many challenges which will surely be discussed at this event today. I would also encourage you to continue battling for the Gaelic language because languages are a source of cohesion, <coughs> identity and cultural richness and we cannot afford to lose them. We have no doubt about this in Catalonia. Although history has gone against Catalan all too often, the insistence of its speakers on using it as their mother tongue has enabled it to survive. As we have noted, the activism of each speaker is the key to its survival. Nowadays, Catalan has 10 million speakers and a regulatory framework in Catalonia which protects it. Nevertheless, we seek to do more than that. Ours is a European language and we have no intention of giving up in our efforts to have it recognized by the European Union's institutions as an official language, as a working language for them whereby its speakers can, for example, address these institutions in Catalan. We seek the same status as the other official EU languages. Here, our Ministry for Foreign Action which we are sharing this event with today, is doing an outstanding job. In addition to promoting the language abroad as a government, we are also committed to safeguarding the language rights of speakers in our own country. And this is not always straightforward. A court ruling has recently threatened the successful Catalan school model anchored in the language immersion, which enables us to use Catalan as a teaching language. This is because the Spanish authorities see language 
as an instrument working for a political idea and not as a way to foster cohesion and progress. In Catalonia, we are striving to deliver an agreed national response which upholds this model and avoids having to teach 25% of classes in Spanish as a result of a court ruling. This response needs to be baked by political and social consensus and by the languages community as a whole. Furthermore, in my own field of justice, I have set myself the priority target of stepping up the use of Catalan. This situation is currently extremely worrying because to give you just one example, only 7% of judgments are in Catalan, whereas 50 years ago, the figure was 20%. We need to make sure that Catalan is also the language of everyday use in the justice system. To this, to this end, we have several projects underway involving regulations, trainings, scholarships, compilings and updating legal language, digital resources and so on. Yet this is not enough. Institutions make instruments available, but all legal practitioners and members of the public also need to be language activists to use it, to feel that it is a useful and effective language in legal proceedings. And we are working on this because only in this way we'll be able to fully exercise the language rights we have as citizens coupled with access to effective due process guarantees. Uh, the use of Catalan in the justice system is one of the great challenges we face as a country. Yet, there are also others which I am sure will be addressed and discussed today at this event, which I hope you will find very rewarding. Thank you very much. Moltes gràcies. Guruh Mahagut. Thank you, Minister. Now I give the floor to the David Hicks, one of the main, main promoters of the uh, ELEN uh, network, working for language every, uh, every day and every time. Uh, David will be the, uh, you will introduce the other speakers and, and then moderate the debate. Okay, that's the floor is yours. Iskarikasko yeah. <clears throat> Gorka. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here today to discuss the work behind um, Irish becoming an EU official working language and how we can work for the same status for Catalan. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Catalan Minister um, for Justice, Lord Ciro, for her contribution just now. Um, very um, good, you know, we, we had a discussion actually earlier a few months ago about working for the increase uh, um, of Catalan in the, in, in the justice, you know, something Ellen, obviously, we fully support. Now, Ellen, if you don't know about us, we're an international NGO working for the protection, promotion and well-being of lesser used languages, um, and we aim to represent the 10% of uh, EU population that speaks one of these languages. And we have Catalan member organizations, Plataforma, Pela Lengua, Omnium Cultural, um, ACPV in Valencia, Obra Cultural Balear in, in the in Balearic Islands, and Seaman as well in Catalonia. And, it, you know, we, we say lesser used languages, but really we can't really include Catalan as lesser used or even a, a minority languages. I think these days, with Alan, we, we more say, you know, we, we're working for lesser used languages and Catalan, because how exactly can you be a minority language or a lesser used language when you have 10 million speakers? You're kind of medium sized um, European language, you know, like something like Estonian has 1 million speakers, Latvian 1.3 million speakers, and so Catalan's up there in the middle, more like something like Greek or Swedish, um, you know, around this, um, around this mark. And, and, you know, we walk the corridors of the Parliament and the Commission and we hear many different languages, and some are widely spoken, some less widely spoken. Um, and, you know, Catalan is one of them. Um, and we know full well that, you know, some in, in the parliament, a lot of the um, interpreters, you know, can speak Catalan, as some of the Spanish interpreters. So you know, we know that it's quite, would be quite easy to make this provision. 
So we have this question is that in Ellen is why do we continue to have this situation of uh, one language, one state? Why do we have to continue to watch this ridiculous scenario in the parliament when Catalan MEPs aren't able to use their language? Um, happened recently in the petitions committee. If the EU respects linguistic diversity, surely it can act to live up to that statement and start by making Catalan EU official with a view to expanding that to the other co-official and lesser used languages. Surely the object is to communicate with the citizen, the citizen who's you know, um, funding the entire EU project. What better way is there than to assure its use, whether it's Catalan, um, Estonian, Basque, Swedish, Finnish or Breton? They're all European languages and they all deserve to have all the respect and support, not just what states have deemed to be EU official languages. And does a country really have to become independent before its language can gain EU official status? Language rights are human rights, and surely it's time for the EU to recognise that fact and ensure that all citizens are able to use their European languages in the European institutions. We need to see a reform of the EU's outdated language policy to make it inclusive instead of exclusive. It should represent equality, not in inequality and discrimination. It should represent what we are aspiring to do with the European project, not entrenching the mistakes of the past. So Ellen recommends that the EU adopts an EU language plan. This was in our conference, um, our rec proposals to the Conference on the Future of Europe, that effectively manage, manages European language diversity um, and that meaningfully promotes, protects and works towards equality and usage for all European minoritized and endangered languages and Catalan. Um, and so turning to the Irish campaign, and back in the days of when I used to work for the Bureau for Lesser Used Languages um, and, and with Eurolang back then, um, we first covered the status demo in Dublin and then campaigned, helped the campaign for official status during the Irish presidency, presidency of the EU in 2004. Back then it seemed ridiculous um, that we had an EU member state not quite willing to push for the use of its own language. At the same time in 2004, we had the enlargement um, with official status for lots of languages um, that had you know, around one million speakers. Um, so it was you know, very good you know, to, to work for that back then. And then the campaign continued and we had another push in 2016 um, with Leona Riada's language strike in the parliament. This was particularly effective, something that we backed up, and it helped to push the campaign along. And we got where we are today now with um, Irish becoming e an EU official working language. Um, it was in, Decem in December. Um, and this is a huge achievement. And this is what here Pada and Dohi are going to uh, discuss, um, the details of how we got to this point, the lessons that can be learned from it for the Catalan campaign, um, and also it would be interesting to hear about how, what effect has that had on Irish itself with its use um, you know, back in Ireland um, in a, in a, and the positive effects of it. So I'm very pleased to introduce um, Padre and Dahi. Um, Dahi McCarty is a barrister. Uh, he lives in the Rathcarn Gael Tocht in uh, County Meath. Um, and he's been involved with the campaign for the recognition of the Irish language as a full working language in the EU since the inception of this campaign. He's a former president of Conrad Nagoya and has been active in all aspects of the work of the organization, in particular language rights and the protection of the girl tops. Through his work as a barrister, he's been involved in a number of central cases regarding Irish language rights, including the first case in the Irish language to come before the European Court of Justice. Pedro Melanico is head of advocacy and assistant general secretary of the Conrad Nagoya. Padra lives in the Moikulin um, Girl Tuck in County Galway and has also been involved with the campaign for recognition of the Irish language as a working language in the EU. As head of advocacy and as a volunteer member of Conrad, he's been involved in all aspects of language development, including Irish language education, language rights, and the protection of the Girl Tuck, including the new Girl Tuck language planning program. So I'd like to introduce um, um, you to them. They're going to have a PowerPoint um, and take turns um, discussing the topic. Okay, Guru Margaret. Okay, um, yeah, I'll make, make, make a start of that. The, the, if we can get the PowerPoint up. And again, just to say, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's, I suppose, to 
put myself on Dahi. Uh, it's on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but myself and Dahi will probably sitting here slightly gobsmacked to, to hear that, that there are 10 million Catalan speakers uh, and the whole. It's, you know, there's, there's a different symmetry. We, we have the Republic of Ireland, we have, we have our Irish as a national language, but we have to fight with our own government to get, to get rights for it. Um, from my looking in from the outside, the, the, the situation in terms of language in Catalan is much, is much stronger, but obviously you don't have your own state. Um, so we won't, we, won't, we won't go into that situation at the moment. Yeah, so we won't, we won't, we won't go into, into that, that situation at the moment. What we'll do is we're just going to go through um, the, the, the history of this, and then at the end, we can look back at the Catalan situation and what lessons can be learned and what advice we, 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 can, we can have. Um, you know, I think neither Dahi or myself would like to pretend that we are experts on, you know, we have, we have fought for this, we've taken one step forward, two step backwards, one step forward all along this, this campaign. So can we get up the, yeah. the, um, could you put the PowerPoint? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next. Okay. So David asked me that, that just, we look at, at a couple of things and the overall challenges. Um, and like amazingly, the, the biggest challenge we had initially was to convince our own, the Irish government, to seek this status um, from, the, from the EU. And it would be my experience in dealing with the EU once the, the government made the decision that once they were aware of what was needed, they were very open. Uh, you know, we had meetings with some of the most senior people there saying, look, tell us what you want, and we would provide it. Uh, so they have been much, much, much more open. So that was the, the, the first campaign, um, as is the want of the Irish government they tend to kick things down the road a bit. So once we did achieve that status, uh, there was a series of derogations um, to build up the workforce. But of course, Ireland being Ireland, that, that, wasn't, that didn't happen. So we, we um, had, in effect, a second campaign um, to end that series of derogations, which we finally did. Um, the, the derogation in 2015, it was extended, but with the commitment that it would finish on the 21st or the 31st of December uh, last year. And then probably, and this is probably where, where, where Dahi will come in in particular, because he's, be, he's been a lot of work on that. Once that decision was made, the work involved, the, the, the hard slog work in terms of building up the capacity uh, to to provide the services so that so that the EU could function with, with Irish as, as an official language. Uh, so could have the next. Uh, this, the, the, the history, the, the campaign, that's just a shot of the, the more Hewl the March we had in Dublin in 2004, uh, which was a central part of the, of the campaign. Uh, could have the next, the next slide again, please. Now again, I, I I won't go through this. Hugely, you'd be glad to hear. But it's it's basically when when Ireland joined the EC uh, originally, there was literally no mention made of the Irish language or Irish lang Irish language rights. And Irish ha the Irish language had very um, little use. Really, it was it was a, a treaty language. The treaties <coughs> were were um, provided as uh, and there was there was there was, there was, there was a, other other rights. So. Then um, the, 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 the the campaign started in, in, in 2004. Uh, we had a seminar at the Iraq Snagel, which is the Irish language, the Irish language festival. Um, and we, we set up a campaign, Stardust, to receive, to achieve full working um, recognition as a full working language in, in, the, in the EU. So that, that campaign, uh, we built up a huge level of community support and we might come back to that again in terms of, of the lessons to be learned in terms of, of, of Catalan. Um, we had a uh, obviously a huge lo lobbying campaign. We had a, a series of events um, in terms of the, the lobbying with the, the, the government and lobbying with the, with the, the, the um, 
the, the politicians, uh, particularly working with, with, with each, each of the parties. I would just like to mention one of the events we did have at that time, which was also uh, involved with a campaign that we had that begin just uh, that we brought to fruition at the end of last year in terms of, of development of, of, a, of a, a lang bit of rights for the Irish language. One of the events we had in Dublin in, in, in September, February 2015, uh, the Catalan Ombudsman, uh, Rafael Riobo Imaso, uh, was with us on that. And so it's, it's interesting that we're back here today trying, trying to, to help the Catalan cause. Um, so that's that campaign uh, continued. Um, eventually, the government uh, capitulated, I suppose, to say, and asked the EU to um, to provide that that Irish would have that have that have that status. So that that continued on. You can see the the um, the, t the, the, the the time scale there. Uh, in two thousand and five, the Irish government. Asked the the EU for recognition. That was um, followed through in in June, and then on in the first of or in two thousand and seven, Irish Ireland Irish became a, a full working language of the EU um, due to the lack of personnel. And this this was genuine. The 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 the, the, the workforce wasn't there in terms of uh, translators, interpreters. Uh, to to actually go ahead and provide a full a full um, range of services, a five year derogation was uh, implemented, which made sense at the time if the work had been done to to uh, develop the <coughs> the workforce um, by the Irish government. That 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 wasn't done, and the derogation was extended, and <coughs> then I suppose that led to the second campaign. That we we took on to in in the derogation and to to ensure that Irish would would have um, a full working be a full working language and that we would have the workforce there the the, the administrative staff the the <coughs> interpreters the translators um, all that backup all that that human resource to to provide the service um, that that campaign again we worked a lot with the community to build up community support but it was mainly geared um as a pol um, political campaign on the irish government and also on the with the the eu itself we we had an, a number of visits uh here in terms of lobbying our own meps and the the eu the various eu um institutions um that's in effect, it was was successful. Um, the government did ask for a further five year derogation, but on the basis that at the end of that at that five years, on the the thirty first of December twenty twenty one, that Irish would have a full full recognition, and that five year period would be used to build up the human resource. And um, that he will go through some 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 of that. Um, so in, in in effect that was the the second campaign we had uh and then the third the third campaign and I'll, I'll hand over to Dahi on, uh, now on that and where the work that was involved to bring that to fruition and I suppose again this would probably be one of the areas which would probably be more is more interest to to yourselves uh in terms of what needs to be done um if leaving aside the political decision uh, the actual practicalities what's needed to th that Catalan will be able to provide that, that that service. So I'll hand over to, to Dahi and we we can do questions and answers at the at the end of the whole the whole program. Right, thanks, Patrick or Margaret. Um, I do a bit of a put your microphone on. Oh, sorry. Um, thanks, Father. Um, I can be heard. Can I? With my thick Wexford accent. Um, hopefully it won't disturb the interpreters too much. Um, I'm going to take a wee step back and talk about three aspects of the of the campaign and three things we didn't realise when we began this back in 2003-2004. Um, and the first thing we didn't realise is that we would succeed. That came as a great surprise to us. But you know, We can say that now because we just won, so we were surprised that we actually won. Secondly, uh, it was surprising how long it actually took that it took 20 years. It won't take 20 years for Catalan, but it took 20 years for us, and I'll go into that in a second. 
And thirdly, we didn't realise the benefits which would flow. We had a vague idea that we had a government from its inception, from the foundation of the state, who saw the Irish language as an ornament as opposed to something that they would use uh, as a working language. And uh, because of our history, because of the great language shift after the famine in the 19th century, etc., etc., um, Irish people saw Catholicism as being the um, defining um, uh, attribute that, they, that, that we had as a nation. Good Irish Catholic mother of 12, that sort of thing. And I think it happened as well in the Kingdom of Aragorn and Castile that the Catholic religion was used to tie together the various um, nationalities in, in the Iberian Peninsula, well, outside the port, well, Portugal included for a short time as well. Um, uh, to go into the the the, um, the success that that we uh, that we won initially, um, we won the campaign very quickly on an emotional level. That in two thousand and four, um, it became clear that to be an official EU language didn't necessitate your being an imperial language, because the four original official languages were all imperial languages. Um, Italian was an imperial language in Eritrea, in Ethiopia, and Somalia. Um, Dutch was an imperial language in um, Indonesia, um, in South Africa, and of course French and, and, uh, and German were imperial languages as well. Um, but it moved to a situation where languages like Estonian and Maltese were uh, the smaller national languages were also going to be official languages. And I knew we were going to win when I went into my bank manager in the four courts, the four courts is the, 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 um, the seat of, uh, of the Irish judicial system. And um, the lady who ran the branch was hard-nosed, middle-class, South County Dublin, practical woman. And she says, Dotty, are you involved in this campaign to make Irish an officially your language? And I thought, you know, I said, OK, I, I might as well own it and take the abuse that's about to come, you know. What are you doing that for? Waste of time. Why can't you speak English? But she turned to me and says, well, every other Mickey Mouse country has their language as an official language. So it's interesting how um, your inferiority complex can work to your benefit because people thought that they were losing something, that other countries were getting a benefit and Ireland wasn't. And that we could make comparisons to smaller nation states with smaller national languages and a history of colonization like the Baltics, that, and also Malta. People would have had some experience with Malta on holiday and that sort of thing, so that made us kind of real for them. Um, on the practical level, the Irish government is always very concerned to, um, we have a policy of infestation in relation to the European institutions. So if you want to get as many Irish people as possible into positions of power to make decisions in relation to agriculture, um, transport, trade, that sort of thing. And to get any job in the European Union, you need two official EU languages. To be promoted, you need three. So they saw Irish becoming an official EU language as a way to increase the number of Irish people, that they could put Irish down as an official language, they'd be in the door. And then they could progress, and then they could, there would be someone that you could ring up and say, I'm having a problem with a certain aspect of, of EU policy, of federal policy. Now, I said the bad word, a federal policy, and I need your help, and people would be in, the, in a situation to, to help out. Now, the pr they knew there was a price to pay, and the price to pay would, was um, a greater status for Irish as an efficient and working language in Ireland. But they were prepared to pay that, and the way they got around paying too high a price at that stage was that they um, gave us uh, official status with a derogation that only, if you're familiar with European law, directives, regulations, decisions, that only regulations adopted jointly by the Parliament and the Council would be translated. And that was facilitated for Maltese during the Irish presidency because the Maltese had difficulty getting enough people because they've got a, a very small population. So they needed a rollout of official status over, I think it was three years. So that was a way that Irish could be made an official language too without... Um, the burden of employing 200 translators and lawyer linguists on day one. So that, but it also maintained the Irish government, as in the civil service, the, 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 the policy of Irish being symbolic. Oh, we're a different nation, we speak Irish, there it is on the sign. So it's very different to the, the Catalan um, policy since the late 70s of, of normalisation.
We don't have a policy of normalisation. We're trying to get a policy of normalisation using pressure from above at EU level. I think in Catalonia, since the, the home rule, if I can call, use an Irish term, the home rule government operates through Catalan. Um, the parliament, I understand, operates through Catalan. Um, local police do, but the Guardia Civil don't, so it's, and the courts don't. So you have that type of um, dig diglossia, and it's to plug holes, I think, that you need EU um, uh, recognition for, for, for Catalan that you can plug holes in legislation, in judgments from the court and that sort of thing. So it's a different dynamic. But, uh, um, so how long it would take? We didn't think it would take 20 years. Again, if you understood how it's like raising children, if you knew how hard it was going to be, you wouldn't do it. OK, so uh, we didn't think it would take 20 years. We were very we looked at all the Irish medium schools around the country, all the people who had fluent Irish used it, but they weren't too good at the old reading and writing. You know, in minoritized languages, and it, again, it probably doesn't, it would apply to Galician maybe, you know what I mean, or Basque as opposed to Catalan, or maybe Catalan in, 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 um, in the Balearics, I don't know, or in Sardinia. You know, they're grand at the, the old talking, but they're reading and writing, and no same problem in Welsh because the Welsh speak one language and write another. <laughs> um, so there was a difficulty there. And also that the Irish government had a policy since the early 70s of um, letting the Irish language fade away by um, uh, neglect, a policy, an official policy of neglect. So the standards in the schools weren't great either. So we genuinely needed to, to build up resources, um, especially at a third level, and to take people from a level of fluency to a kind of a PhD level. And there was resources needed there. Another problem that we had was that we're not very good at teaching languages because we're an Anglophone country. And there's an Anglophone mentality there, not as bad as America or England, but it's still it's still there. And um, while a lot of people might do, everyone has to do Irish and English for the Leaving Cert. They might also do French or German, but they wouldn't be great. So we needed to, in order to fill the gaps, we use, as the Maltese had used before us, um, temporary positions, temporary contracts. People would become translators or lawyer linguists um, for three years on a temporary contract where you only needed two languages and they would acquire French on the job and they would then either do an internal competition or do EPSO and then they would be made permanent. And once they're permanent, then they can move on the Great Irish Dream to trade, agriculture, fisheries, whatever. So that was, um, I don't think that's going to apply to Catalan because people have, well, you'll have Catalan, you'll have Spanish, you'll have English. You know, a lot of people, so I can't. And French isn't that. If Aquitana was a language now, you'd be flying. <laughs> For uh, an official language to be flying, so I don't think that really applies. To you. If you won't have that type of um, of difficulty, but it, where you will have a difficulty is the acquis communautaire. That when a new country comes into the European Union, you don't come in on Monday and then start applying European law. You have to apply European law over a period, and then you come into the to the union, unless you're hungry. Sorry, <laughs> well, you just ignore it. Yeah, and join the Warsaw and try and rejoin the Warsaw Pact. But um, work will have to be done on the Yaqui um, because th that's a difficulty we had. It's a difficulty you you're going to have as well. Um, the third other thing we didn't realise with the, the benefits which would flow. As I said before, we look for pressure from above. A benefit of that has been the amendment of our Official Languages Act that by 2030, 20% 20 of the people recruited into the civil service are going to be Irish speaking. Like of, of a population of 5 million, we got a daily number of speakers of less than 100,000. We've got people who can speak the language fluently, maybe another 100,000, but don't because of just, because it's not used. It's not used because it's not used, you know? Why is Galician not used more? Because it's not used. Why is Catalan used? Because it's used, you know? Why do young people speak Catalan when their parents didn't? Because they were educated through it. That was the normal language they now grew up with because of the decision made years ago. So that's it. It's used because it's used, and it's not used because it's not used. Um, as regards dictionaries, we've been very remiss in our work on dictionaries, again, due to the unofficial policy of neglect. But we've got a new dictionary there recently. We're going to have our first, for the first time, an Irish-Irish dictionary. Now, this might seem kind of crazy <laughs> for, um, from a Catalan point of view. But again, I think Catalan identity has been very tied up with the language. And in Ireland, it hasn't as much as it should be. It was tied up with Catholicism.
but I think we're, we're, go, we're soon going to see a situation where less than 50% of people in Ireland will identify as Catholic. So they identify as not being Protestant, <laughs> but they won't identify as being Catholic, if you know, but that's, that's a, a, different, a different matter. Um, resources as well. Um, the judgments, so the big judgments in, uh, of, say, um, von Gandenloos, Enel, Simmental, all these, these cases being available in Irish are great resources to teach law through Irish at third level. That sort of thing. And we didn't really, even if you go to the, the parliamentarium down the road to do your tour, you can do it in Irish. So that sort of, like, the more it's used, the more it's used, the more it's normalised, the more it's normalised. And the more you can say to an institution in, in Dublin, well, we have this in Brussels, why don't we have it here? You know, there's no real argument and no real answer to that. So that's our dynamic, which is, in a way, it's the opposite of your dynamic. But what we have in common is that there are, there are gaps. There's a big hole in the donut, <laughs> you know, and um, the fact that all our speakers are bilingual means that we're, we're all 30 years away from total collapse, no matter how big a language is. Irish in the 1840s was a bigger language than Catalan, bigger language than... Norwegian, <laughs> um, Welsh even at that stage, even though Welsh was a purely Welsh speaking country, but we had 8 million people, 4 million those spoke Irish. So we were, as you are today, if you like, well, as you know, as, yeah. Um, I, I, as regards um, moving things forward, the EU is a union of states, as we found out with the referendum on independence in Catalonia. The EU is a union of states, and that, that is the basis of it. You know, and it has to come, I imagine, from the kingdom of Argonne and Castile. And it's got to be reminded that it is the kingdom of Argonne and Castile, you know, that the, the Aragon <laughs> is, is still there. And um, that there's an advantage there for the Spanish government will be that there'll be more. It won't be just Catalans. It'll be people from the Balearic Islands. It can be people from um, um, Valencia as well who would be able to fill positions as language experts in, 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 an, in a Catalan unit. Um, the price to pay, of course, is that you're giving um, extra recognition to the Catalan that they might not want to give, but it could be a trade-off in a constitutional settlement, a final con an ausk like I mean, that, that's a matter for yourselves. I don't know what, what the demand is or what would satisfy people. But I think if it formed part of that, if it formed part of a, a final constitutional settlement, there would be something in it for the Spanish government. If you had, say, two independent countries with a common foreign affairs, that sort of thing, that's, it's none of my business, I'm just r running ideas, um, that there would be something for a, 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 a new constituted kingdom of Aragon and Castile, <laughs> that they would have double the amount of... Like, it's, it's great for us in, say, the Court of Justice that we have an Irish language unit and an English language unit, and they're all full of, full of Irish people, you know? It's good to have that. It's good to have that political capital, that human capital there. So there, there is something in it for, um, for, for the member state. Um, I think that's about. I think that's about it. I've probably got yeah. over time. Did you um, want to carry on with the PowerPoint um, that was prepared? Um, well, I, I think I've covered it. But you covered not, everything. Yeah, yeah we, we can click, we can click through it quickly to see if there's anything. Yeah. That we, was, we yeah, was, I just wonder if there's any other points you wanted to raise that were on the PowerPoint. Um, well, there were kind of. It, it was safe. It just go through it. Uh, um, there's just the. Um, yeah, it, it just uh, it, regard, it addresses the practical things that I, I spoke about there. Um, say that the, the, the particular um, courses that need to be put together, but there are many courses in, in um, how to read and write properly. You know, literacy in a minoritized language is an issue that people don't really address. You know, people are all delighted in, 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 in Wales and in Ireland that people can speak the language. And uh, when you say, well, you know, you should, should write it a bit better, you're kind of going, the, the attitude is, well, you should be happy that we're speaking it to you. Do you know what I mean? But I don't think that's an issue because of the education system you've had for. 20 years of this in, in, in Catalonia, where the schools are generally through, through Catalan or, or more. Um, so those issues as regards capacity don't really apply. And I think that you, you, you'd, the, issue, the only issue you'd have is the acquis. And that could be made an academic. Um, again, I mean, again uh, it would have to be done. That would take a, a number of years. That would be your lead-in time to get the acquis. Um, translated to Catalan, um, but th that's the only lag you would have. 
you know, unlike the legs that we have. And then that, that's just how they think, how it ran down. That's because the, um, of the uh, neglect of Irish in the education system. But even translating, uh, translating laws is a particular skill. But um, I run courses that take six months or so. You could probably do it less than that. And people are generally trained on the job in, um, in the institutions. Anything else? Can you just go on? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. You know, you have, it's not just um, language experts, but to have backup staff, etc. There's 200 jobs there. High paying jobs. No tax. Ex um, a lawyer in English can start off in six and a half thousand euro a month. And that you get about six into your hand. You can get that in your 20s. It's good money, you know. It's good money. And that does, that does give a status of language, you know. People would say to you in Ireland, why are you speaking Irish to that child? Well, there's a full answer, isn't it? Six and a half thousand good reasons every month. <laughs> and how are you? The job with the coal might not work out. You know. <laughs> um, yeah. That's it. Well, it. It was strange. Like We, we managed to... Um, we, were, we were afraid that, it, that he, we would have a, ha a half status forever, like we have at home. But um, when... Irish people in the institution started to retire at 50, <laughs> having worked their fingers to the bone. Um, they needed to get people in, and they were prepared to pay the price of making Irish a full official European language, and they would deal with the consequences at home, because they needed people in the, in, in, at union level. And the fact that we could follow Malta's route of putting people in temporary contracts uh, and, and filling the spaces um, because it's very difficult to get a job through EPSO. Have I gone over time horribly, have I? We're, we're OK. Um, my, my question actually was um, to Tony, um, is with Eva um, in Barcelona is, is speaking to us. Do, do we do that next and then have the questions? Yeah? OK. So we are, we are, we are, we, we're, what we're going to do is come back to questions at the end um, from all of the audience. But now I would like also to introduce Ava Ponce from the University of Barcelona, um, who's going to give us the um, like Catalan dimension. She's um, an expert in constitutional law. Um, and thank you very much for joining us, Eva. Thank you. Um, thanks for the uh, invitation to participate in this forum with the Irish partners. Uh, I will talk about uh, Catalan in the uh, European Union. Um, as historical background, we must say that the demand for uh, Catalan official status with the U U uh, EU has a, a long history. In 1986, at the time of the negotiation for the incorporation of Spain in the European communities, the Spain government only requests official status for Castilian. Thus, only Castilian, the official language of the state in accordance with Article 3, uh, Section 1 of the Spanish Constitution, obtain the status of language of the treaties and the official language and working language of the European constitutions and bodies, uh, according to Council Regulation 158. Uh, this fact also has uh, symbolic effects, reserving the name Spanish to this language in the European context, which imply a subtle but important change with respect to the provisions of Section 2 of the same Article 3 of the Spanish Constitution, which recognize the existence of several Spanish languages that will be also official in accordance with the respective statutes of autonomy. Uh, Catalan, as you know, is official uh, in uh, an official language in the Balearic Island, uh, in Catalonia, in the Valencian community under the name of Valencian. As Basque is official in the Basque country and Navarre, and Galician in Galicia. And Occitan is also official in Catalonia since the reform of Statute of Autonomy in 2006. Uh, the decision of the Spanish government was criticized um, from the outset by social activists and regional authorities. Uh, the Catalan community being the forefront of demand requesting the European Parliament uh, on an official status for the Catalan language. Um, you can remember a huge demonstration before the European Parliament in 1988 and the same year the formal petitions of the parliaments of Catalonia and the Balearic Island for an official status for Catalan. 
As a consequence, the European Parliament approved the resolution on language in the community and the situation of Catalan in 1990, which expressed a, favor a position uh, favorable uh, to a greater recognition of the Catalan language within the community institutions and called the Council and the Commission to take action to achieve the following objective. Uh, first, the publication in Catalan of the community's treaties and basic text. Second, the use of uh, Catalan for disseminating information concerning the European institutions in the public media. Third, the inclusion of Catalan in the programs set up by the commissions for learning European languages. And for the use of Catalan by the Commission's office in its written and oral dealings with the public in the autonomous communities in question. Generally, uh, with the exception of the European Commission representation in Barcelona, operational since 1991, this resolution did not give rise to any relevant uh, legal consequence and his gave the Catalan language a minimum recognition, practically symbolic in nature. Nevertheless, the Reading Resolution was useful through all these years, given that Catalan have at least slightly improved its recognition within the linguistic system of the EU. During the following uh, decade, uh, political agreements between the two major uh, Spanish political parties, uh, Socialist Party and Popular Party, introduced initial measures to, um, for uh, uniformization and control from the center of the autonomous communities, which become a clear recentralization during the government of Popular Party since uh, 2001. No significant achievement in the use and the recognition of the Catalan language can be found for quite some years. Uh, a new, uh, moment was the drafting and signing of the European Constitutional Treaty uh, in 2003 to 2005 that seemed to open a new perspective and opportunities for the official language communities of Spain. With the Spanish Socialist Party uh, entering the government of Spain in April 2004, to reach the majority need uh, to sign the draft of the European uh, Constitutional Treaty, Socialists need support from other members of the Spanish Parliament and found that support in regional political parties. In return, Catalan political parties explicitly demand support to amend the list of language in which the EU Constitution will be drafted and request specifically to incorporate Catalan and subsequently Basque and Galician. This place, the Catalan, Galician and Basque language, uh, this good place, no? the Catalan, um, Galician and Basque language at the level of Gaelic with the EU. At this time, no, Gaelic was treaty language, but not EU official language and uh, entailed no economic cost in principle. After a long negotiation, the constitutional treaty opened the door to publication, the text of the treaty in any other language determined by the member states, among those which, in accordance with their constitutional provisions, have the status of official language in whole or in part of this territory. Spain finally delivered four certified copies, the Basque, the Galician, and two identical ones for Catalan Valencia. So the constitutional uh, treaty did not come into force, this article has survived and was maintained in the new Article 55 of the Treaty of the European Union and uh, 358 of the EU Operation Treaty, reformed by the Lisbon Treaty. This provision has just a symbolic value set, set, since it lacks uh, practical effects. However, it sets a precedence in, uh, in recognizing regional and minority language, and it could make it easier for the European Union to establish a specific institutional recognition in favor of this regional and minor minority language with official status uh, inside the states. See, from this perspective, uh, the recognition of the co-official language in the EU was uh, remarkable. However, this agreement turned out to be a partly symbolic act. And for that, the petitioners um, continued to demand for a true practical change and official recognition of um, uh, community language, um, uh, community minority language in Spain. 
December uh, 2004, the Spanish Ministry for Foreign Affairs uh, presented to the European Council a memorandum of the mm, request for recognition in the European Union of all the official language in Spain. The uh, memorandum gave the possibility to an EU institution to agree certain official recognition to those languages that are official in the autonomous communities. To achieve this objective, it proposed amending Regulation 158, laying down the general rules for the language regime to the, uh, um, of the EU institutions, including an annex to that regulation. Uh, the memorandum specified uh, three areas of official use that must be inc included in this annex. First, written communication from citizens with the institutions and bodies of the European Union. Second, the official publication of community texts. Third, oral use within the institutions of the European Union. And in addition, it also requests that uh, this language to be fully, fully incorporated into the EU uh, lingua program. Finally, the memorandum states that the Spanish government itself will bear the economic cost deriving from the modification of the language regime. Finally, the addition of an annex in the uh, Regulation 158 uh, was not achieved. Uh, we must remember that it needs the unanimity of the member states. And in response, uh, response to the memorandum, um, the European Council of June uh, 2005 uh, reached a conclusions uh, that authorize uh, limited use of the uh, at, at the EU, uh, EU level of language recognized by member states other than the, the official working language of the EU. Um, for not um, um, including in, in, the, in the regulation 158, it was formally argued that language that were not already treaty language could not be included in the language regime. The explicit, explicit purpose of the conclusion is to bring the union close to its citizens. As for the use provided for the conclusion, there is a formal coincidence with the three areas covered by the Spanish memorandum. Also, the content of the prerogatives uh, of use was uh, reduced. Conclusions identified uh, general, gen generically this language as additional languages without naming on any of these languages. It can be claimed that a new category of language, the so-called additional language, was created within the language system of the Union. However, these languages are not considered official language as the conclusion do not have the capacity to change the language regime of the Union. The possibility of using this additional language is put into practice through administrative agreements between the Council and the other institutions and the corresponding state. This instrument, instrument uh, the administrative agreement, does not correspond to any of the typical legal acts or rules of the community law. It is therefore a sui generis legal instrument or act. However, the binding nature of the agreement should be emphasized. In practice, uh, the agreement signed between the Kingdom of Spain and various institutions and bodies of the Union, uh, specifically with the Council, the Commission, the Ombudsman, the Committee of the Regions, the European Parliament, the Court of Justice, and the EU, um, and the European Economic and Social Committee, between the years uh, 2005 and 2009, um, have not had any tangible application beyond allowing the Ural use of Catalan by political representative in some meetings of the Council and in meetings of the Committee of the Regions. Uh, in relation to the agreements, some relevant questions will be uh, the following. First, the agreements implies a new status for regional and minority language, and concretely for Catalan. 
the answer is that a change in the language regime of the EU has not taken place through the signing of the administrative agreements. The majority of the social and political demands um, are still pending. Eh? Uh, second uh, question. Um, the agreements uh, imply a complex and incompre incompre incomprehensible system of recognition. Um, the technical complexity of the system of agreements make it difficult to understand and uh, an access for citizens, and that in practice does not seem compatible with the basic purpose expressed by the conclusions to bring the union closer to all its citizens. It is very difficult to uh, to put in practice the prerogative, as for example, to communicate with Catalan with institution um, bodies. It's a very complex uh, procedure. Uh, third question: uh, A poor implementation of the agreements. Who is who is on? The involvement of the autonomous communities in the implementation of the agreements has been very uneven, with, but uh, Basque Country and Catalonia were, uh, uh, have a more uh, constant use of prerogative of use in the Council and the Committee of the Region by out, uh, political authorities from these territories. The practical interpretation, uh, the political sorry, interpretation of the Kingdom of Spain transfers the, uh, to the autonomous communities the responsibility for the application of the agreements. For question, were the agreements a way to deactivate uh, ulterior demands of a European statute for these languages? In fact, the agreements have been able to promote the appearance that the demand for a European status for the Catalan is satisfied. But the majority of the uh, political demands are still pending. We can summarize a clear legal recognition anchored in the institutional language regime, as well as appropriate and proportional treatment within the framework of promotional actions with linguistic content in the EU. In that sense, Article 6, Section 3 of the 2006 Statute of Autonomy of Catalonia includes a clear mandate addressed both to the Generalitat, the Autonomous Political Institution of Catalonia, and to the Spanish state, in saying that the Generalitat and the state shall undertake the necessary measures to obtain official status for Catalan within the European Union. In, in contrast with this mandate, what is the current situation of Catalan in the EU? Um, the lack of recognition of Catalan by linguistic regime of the Union has very important negative effects on the legal protection of this language. First of all, in terms of the lack of warranties of its use in the European sphere. The linguistic, linguistic rights recognized by uh, recognizing the treaties linked to the enjoyment of European citizenship do not cover the Catalan language. Catalan also finds disadvantage in accessing European programs with a linguistic dimension. European terminology is not officially standardized in Catalan, despite initiatives supported by public bodies to develop European terminology in Catalan. As positive warranties derived from primary law of the EU following the reform of Lisbon, the Treaty of the Uno European Union recognized the principle of protection of linguistic diversity, pre previously included in Article uh, 22 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And now the treaty in Article 3 states that the Union shall respect its rich cultural and linguistic diversity. That's a very generic uh, mandate uh, in, the, in the treaty that cover all, all the European language. Uh, after that, the Lisbon Treaty uh, recogni recognized uh, also the rights of persons belonging to minorities in Article 2, that say that the Union is founded on the values of respect of human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. 
But uh, despite the proposal of the European Union uh, and European NGO, uh, this approach uh, linked to the protection of minorities has not materialized uh, until now in the adoption of binding minimum standards to ensure, to ensure that member states um, uh, respect these standards um, uh, established by uh, European uh, law. Even more uh, important uh, is the uh, negative effect that implies the lamination of the official internal status of Catalan by secondary law and state legislation transposing European directives. That implies, in practice, the deofficialization of the Catalan language in areas governed by secondary European law, which only covers the official language or the language of the Union. On the basis of the European law, the Spanish state legislates and reserves the management of important sectors in which only Castilian Spanish becomes a necessary language, the unique language or the language used by default. Uh, there are a lot of examples of this um, uniformization, uh, linguistic uniformization linked to the transposition of uh, directive, for example, in public contracts, in management of public subsidies, uh, or uh, in media, media in the recent um, state uh, audiovisual act. As for the near future, and to close this brief review uh, of the situation of Catalan in the European Union, we hope that a new stage um, founded in the provision of the status of, of autonomy on. Uh, 2006 will begin in which concrete measures and tangible uh, achievement will be made to make the EU a context of new opportunities for the Catalan language. Thanks for your attention. Muchas <clears throat> uh, gracias, uh, Professor Pons. That's fantastic uh, presentation, really very uh, um, clarifying uh, situation. Um, for Catalan and um, in, in its and that is language and its status for the EU, are, um, Professor Pons, are you able to stay with us, um, or um, as as we uh, do go into um, questions from the audience, um, could I open the floor then, please, to questions from the audience um, to any of our speakers on 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 the topics um, that we've been discussing? Are there any issues um, you know that you want to raise or? Um, things that you want to um, clarification, um, that would be welcome. I have several questions myself, but in the remaining time, I'd like to give you the opportunity to um, make um, comments or you know, observations or questions. Um, Tony has got the microphone, so if you want to um, ask a question, please raise your hand and Tony will bring you the microphone. No questions or comments from anybody? No? Okay. Well, can I, I'd like to ask just a few um, questions. Firstly, um, to Pader and, and Dachi, is that with the, um, it becoming, having Irish having full EU and official working status, what have you seen in terms of, um, you know, is it impacting on the usage of Irish, of people uh, wanting to use the Irish more, uh, the language more in the community? Um, or people wanting to learn it, um, not just in the Irish-speaking areas, but b more broadly in Irish society? It's probably too soon yet to see a result in terms of the community. Um, over the last five years in particular, we would have seen a huge increase in terms of, the, of university, third level, third level in particular, as the jobs kick in and the jobs are important or there, there's no question the, the old question you know that what uses irish uh, as dahi was was saying this is a concrete example example um it is also working its way through the school system because um you know you've got career guidance teachers who suddenly this is now uh something that, that, that that's on the radar it's also on the radar of um students from different different backgrounds who maybe you know have a french speaking background um east european speaking background suddenly if they now have their qualification in irish 
their their qualification in English and the third home language, they have opportunities now that that, that, that didn't have before. So we would see that uh, kicking in. We would see it working its way down. There had been a against uh, more that his area number of of uh, court cases where the status of the Irish language in the European Union has been mentioned in court judgments in terms of Irish language rights, which does have a, have an effect an effect down to the system. Um, Again, it's it's given us a basis, um, and there's been two new committees set up in in the Dáil, you know, based on questions that we've raised. As a result of this, uh, MEPs and Sean Kelly has done has proposed an amendment uh, to legislation gone through the European Union in Irish, which cannot be done in Dáil Éireann. So there were situations like that that that, that we, as Conor Nagel, are using to to, to cap, you know, to to leverage on, on, on what we've achieved we've achieved with, 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 with this. Uh, again, in the Gaelic theories, it is definitely a, a plus that there, there are opportunities arising um, from this. But again, as, as, as Dahi has gone, gone through, um, the, you know, the ability to speak Irish fluently, even, even in the Gaelic, doesn't mean that they, <coughs> they have the the ability to you know to work as translators so there is a lot of work that needs to be done uh, there but again that is that is that is that is progressing you know and um, you know i would definitely see see that pro that, pro that progressing further mm -hmm. yeah. uh, do you have anything to add to that yeah i think the word is definitely out there there's a lot of people in ireland who would speak english at home and be sent to irish medium education i'm sure it's the same in in, in catalonia but a lot of those people, once they finished their schooling, were lost in language. They might do courses in medicine or engineering or, or, or such like. But because of the availability of um, the opportunities for employment, they're not lost to the language. They go to a, an institution or a place where Irish is the working language. So that, and that's how you build up a, a community, like in real life. And uh, I was always impressed. The difference between Ireland and Wales is that because Wales had the Reformation, you had clergymen speaking Welsh and uh, in Ireland the, the, the Catholic Church became very anglicised very quickly but the fact that you had that type of um, prestige profession in Wales made a difference there and this is uh, prestige professions coming to Irish and in my own uh, area of law it's very funny that um, we had a number of high court judges do a, a course in Irish last summer in Donegal so it's become extremely bourgeois and that's life you know it's got to be if you want to promote a language it's got to be associated with you know things that we would see as being posh or bourgeois or something like that but I, I was surprised by the people who went that i wouldn't have associated with the irish language and that's called growth you know you don't say ah well you know they never spoke irish to me before you don't say that you say well brilliant another one and another one or someone who you thought opposed you and now is with you great you're welcome you know, come on board. Um, yeah, and I, I want to give Padder um, all the credit because Padder was the applicant in the case that we brought before the European Court of, of Justice. So it's McLanach versus the Minister for Agriculture. So, um, but the way European law, if anyone here knows European law, because of so many languages in the Union and because we can't pronounce each other's names very well, it's going to be called the Irish dog case or the, <laughs> or the, or the Gaelic dog case. Uh, we prefer Irish to Gaelic. Gaelic is three languages. It's Irish, Scottish, and Manx. So to use the word Gaelic is like using the word Romance or Germanic. You know, it just, it's not very, you know. But as mm. Irish is the, our national language. And uh, in the past, people have used Gaelic instead to separate it from the nation. Um, I, I've seen older books that are called Welsh um, Cumbric or something like that, just to separate it from the nation. So you can call the variants of English or oh, North Walian, South Walian. Yeah. There's always that effort by those who want to do your culture damage to separate your language from your nationality. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so and it's just again, if you get, get, like that, that whole question of prestige and, and use is important, uh, hugely important. I mean, Dahi, my, myself, you know, our Irish speakers, we've brought up our families to Irish you know, nothing to do with the possibility of them getting getting employment to be from a, a, a different background. But the the question of prestige and 
employment and use is hugely important. We've seen the same thing with the, the establishment of, of TG Car uh, in terms of where you've got these jobs coming on stream uh, where you have to have Irish. And and there are really very few areas in Ireland where you have to where you have to have Irish. Um, so this the, the the EU is another one. Um, and again, we we could we could see you know you can you can see that working its way through through the, through the system. So it, it is it is going to be hugely important. Okay, uh, Gura Margaret. Um, I think also it's interesting as well. You know, we're helping a lot with the campaign for language legislation in the north. And the way now, you know, because Irish is an EU official language, I think it helps with that campaign as well um, to see, um, because there's, a, you know, again, you know, if, if you're aware of it, there's been a big hold up with uh, the British government and the Irish government promised that there would be language legislation um, back mm. in the, originally the Good Friday Agreement. And this has been held up, but I think, yeah. um, you know, it's helping with that campaign now. And, and uh, do we have, do, is, there, is there actually more, was there questions or what do you say? We have two minutes. Now. Oh, right. Okay. Did you? Sorry. Did you? Yeah. No. No. no just just uh, the, the the question of of the, the 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 Northern Ireland thing is very interesting because obviously, <coughs> as a result of Brexit, Northern Ireland is outside the EU, but any anybody in the north with an Irish passport mm -hmm. uh, is an Irish citizen. So if they're an Irish citizen, they're a European citizen. So there's going to be some very interesting cases yeah. coming down the line on that. That's, sorry, that's in the slide. But. Thanks. So, Tony, can I have a quick question for Eva uh, in Barcelona? Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. 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 Like, Eva, you know, thank you very much for your contribution today. I mean, one of the questions I had for you is that in your view, what do you think is needed at a practical level to get Catalan language ready to be EU official? How much work and resources investment um, would that need and how much time you know I don't know if you would know that it's a big question but um, there's that um, and, and then I would have another question for you after that but you know how much at a practical level what do you think um, would be needed and how long would it take to make Catalan fully an EU official and working language I, I have been studying the, the question of uh, the status of Catalan in the EU uh, 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 for a long time, and, and I don't have this <laughs> the answer to this question. It's, it's very, uh, it's a very, really a very complex question. Um, um, mm, we must remember that the the, the, the statue uh, the, the language regime is a is a question that need the unanimity of the member states. Uh, that that's a political um, obstacle, no. Uh, but after that, that there, there are juridical question, no, a legal question that uh, uh, are not easy to 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 summarize. But but um, um, the question is if uh, with the, the Spanish Constitution uh, that only recognize uh, one official language of the state, no that implies uh, some difficulty to, to reach the official status. Um, uh, as resources, I, I think that Catalan has, uh, <laughs> has the resources. Um, mm, I, I, I talk about there is a, a adapted terminology, and there is a, a private initiative, but support of um, public support. There is uh, that, no? and 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 uh, the fact that the Catalan uh, is official it implies that it um, is uh, um, adapted to 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 be used in all the the sectors. Uh, I think that it's not uh, a problem of resources. It's is um, is more a, a political and a legal uh, question, no? uh, how to reach, and that's a question that I can answer after the, the years that I have studied um, the, the, the question. No, mm. so, yeah. um, and so does anyone here have any questions yet still on the, um, on the further issues raised? Yeah, we have a question here, please, uh, Tony. I got a question for Professor Pons. You just mentioned that uh, this uh, unanimity uh, could be or would be a, a political obstacle. But actually, I, I mean, uh, do you recall any case where the European Council refused to grant 
uh, official status at the EU level on request of one of the member states? No, no, no. Uh, the uh, memorandum um, proposed uh, including an annex in the regulation uh, there was uh, some resistance to to modify the the regulation that's that's the only but in general when the states ask for a recognition of a new official language uh, uh, it, it is recognized but um, I don't know exactly you know uh, uh, what was uh, what it was in, in that moment but uh, it was some resistance to modify the regulation 158 uh, according to the memorandum. That's the, the only question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions before we close? No, okay. All right, well, I just would like to... Yeah, can I just... Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no just again, come back to that, that question, I think, is, is political. Uh, there's no question in terms of the Irish case, it was political. That that was the big, the big issue that we had we had to cross. And when going back to the, the the situation where we were looking for the the ending of the derogation and that the the, the, pro, the, the thing would uh, move on, we organised uh, a trip out to Brussels. Probably one one of our first trips that out, that, that that we had. I was organising on that. When we, when I was dealing with the perm reps, the Irish perm reps office here in Brussels, they were very reluctant to meet. Um, in fact, I'm almost sure that I was organising the meeting through Mairead McGuinness, who was vice president of the Parliament at the time. I'm sure that was Mairead McGuinness's office that got on the phone and said, "You have to meet these guys." But once we did meet them, we had an actual fantastic meeting. We we met. There's maybe ten, twelve people there. Uh, and we followed up that. So I think once, once they took it on board that this was going to happen. After that, everything else was was done. That there, there was there was stuff done that, you know, in terms of that he was setting up the 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 key. That was the big bugbear. Oh, we can't. Nothing can be done because it can't be done. You know, because this can't be be coped with. Once it was decided to go ahead. Fashion effect was set aside. Okay, we, we will we will work with that as needs be, and we will translate it as needs be. And they're, they're, um, the department, the guy that have set up uh, an internship for um, trans translators who are working through some of that. So so that that can be done. The whole question of the getting people through the to the jobs again, as Dahi was saying, the the culinary shadow, the the the, the, the temporary temporary. Um, Temporary contracts, you know. I mean, I've been dealing with some of the heads of of the Irish departments. I was laughing at them. Now you're offering temporary contracts, you know, five years, seven years. You know, <laughs> I mean, for God's sake, if somebody doesn't doesn't get a job or doesn't get a temporary contract and doesn't, you know, get their French up to speed, get their things so they can go through the episode, they should be just taken outside and, you know, dropped over a bridge. But I mean, like there was, everything was moved. And that, that, that also included within the, the, the EU institutions themselves. Um, there was, you know, huge efforts made. There was problems getting people through the EPSO uh, system, the, 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 the temporary contracts were, were, were set up. Now, we, we had the advantage that there were Irish units in, in the, 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 the Commission, the Council and the Parliament. Uh, and again, I would give great credit um, to those units in terms of the work they did in progressing the, the, this, this along as well. But again, I would say it is definitely political because once, once the political thing is, over, is overcome, um, everything else can be can be moved on. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 cost is not it's not it's not huge. The, yeah, the resources no, are, are, yeah. are not huge. Right. I think you know it's interesting as well with Catalan because so much is in place already. They know how to do it. They have like the Catalan Parliament. Anyway, we have to wind up now. Um, you know, Tony's signaling to me, to me frantically to uh, finish. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, Moltes gracias. All right. All right. Okay. I was going to say something very, very briefly. Take one second. Just to my friend down at the bottom of the hall, if Spain, if the Kingdom of Spain, the government of Spain, as a member of Schengen, as a member of NATO, 
as a compliant member of the EU, ask that Catalan be made an official EU language. Your problem will not be in Brussels. I think your problem is Madrid. It's not Brussels. So that's where that's... So thank you. And now, thank you uh, to, for the, to the opponents and the moderator. And now uh, I give the floor to the uh, Minister Victoria Alcina, Minister for Foreign Action and Open Government from, from Barcelona. The floor is yours. Hello. Good morning. C can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. I hope you can hear me well. I'm connecting uh, from the from the Parliament, from the Catalan Parliament, and it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Delegate of the Catalan Government to the European Union, also the representatives of the Conrad Nagailga uh, experts and professors, uh, dear all, it's really a pleasure to join you online and not being able to be today in person for the parliamentary duties that I have uh, back home. So I wanted to uh, start saying thank you to the organizers for making this event possible, also and even more to the participants that have accepted the invitation to be part of this conversation that is truly important for us, and of course also to the attendees that are following us in person or online through the YouTube channel. So thank you and welcome to, to, to all of you. What we are uh, discussing today here, I think it's a double thing, right? And uh, I'm, um, I'm, really, I'm really convinced that uh, you probably already touched all the important points in the previous conversation, but I wanted to emphasize that we have a double reason to be all together around this table today. First of all, because we want to celebrate that the Irish language has just received a shift indeed on January 1st, the official status in the European Union, and this is very important for you, but also very important for us. And this is precisely the second thing that we are discussing here today, so that Catalans are thrilled for this recognition, and we also, uh, we also want to continue our work, to continue our fight for having Catalan, uh, for having the same treatment with the Catalan language. So I think that these two things are the ones that connected us as part of this conversation. Which is the motto of the European Union since 2000? I think it's united in diversity. And this can be translated into this respect for diversity as the cornerstone of the European project and, this, and at the same time to build and to grow the uh, mechanisms to transform this into concrete policies and, and actions. So this is the motto, united in diversity, but we all agree probably that there is a long way to go still in this particular field. Indeed, Today, part of the conversation was also to discuss the past, the present, and the future of the Catalan language in the EU. And we have seen, we have shared all together the deep concern that we have because today Catalan is invisible in the EU institutions. It's not efficient, that's for sure, not even a working language that people can easily use, and it's not a treaty language. So we don't have any of those spaces to be recognized and to be part of the EU institutions. This treaty language treatment was precisely the case of the Irish until January, and indeed uh, the transition to be a full official language, it's very relevant, right, for all the implications that we all know and that you discussed before my, my intervention. But when we are talking about Catalan, we are facing a totally different story. Indeed, when you uh, review, right, how the EU enlargement allowed us to incorporate more official languages, Every, every time that a new language is added, it's more clear the comparative disadvantage that uh, Catalan has in this field. There are today 24 official languages, and I should say that 11 of them, 11 of these uh, official languages have much less speakers than the Catalan language. 
the Catalan language is indeed the 30th, uh, the 30th most um, spoken language in the European Union and uh, continues in this case to be uh, completely a part of the institutions. And this comparative disadvantage, it's very clear when you review these numbers, right? There is indeed no uh, language uh, with the same uh, economic, cultural and, and political dynamism that we have back home that is not recognized as an official language in the EU institutions. And indeed, uh, the recognition and the work that we need to do still in that space is an important piece, it's a very relevant piece of the cake of the foreign agenda that we want to move forward from the Catalan government. We want to defend this full recognition of the Catalan language for a bunch of reasons, but let me highlight a couple of them. First of all, because it's a legal mandate of the Statue of Autonomy of Catalonia. This is a Spanish organic law. So when the Spanish government is not fighting for having uh, an official status for the Catalan language in the European institutions, is not following a legal mandate. And this is something that is very important to explain. Indeed, in the Article 6.3 of the Statute of Autonomy of Catalonia, and I'm going to read the article for you, it literally says, the Catalan government and the Spanish state must take the necessary steps to recognize the official status of Catalan in the European Union. Then we are here and we are reviewing together that we are facing, it's, it's not only the political will of the Catalan government, that, that by the way it is, it's more than that. It's the legal mandate of an Spanish organic law. And this is a message that is important to repeat as many times as needed. A second reason that is also relevant to highlight, besides this comparative analysis of what Catalan language represents in terms of the number of speakers that we have, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's also that this is a measure that is supported by a large majority of the Catalan population. All polls show that at least 70% of Catalans agree that the Catalan language should be official in the EU. And let me, very, let me be very clear at this point that we uh, won't be satisfied with symbolic decisions. We don't want, we don't accept symbolic decisions in that space. We want to be, uh, we want to be recognized as an official language and we won't stop until then. We have the arguments, we have the reason on our side, and this is something that, as I said at the beginning, connects directly with the motto of the European Union, united in diversity. And this implies, of course, multilingualism. I just wanted to add a couple of final ideas. And uh, one of them is that in a lot of cases, the Spanish authorities frame this problem and postpone to solve this problem, postpone the decision, uh, arguing that um, we have legal difficulties to make this possible. And that's, what, that's one of the main points that the Spanish authorities put on the table when we are talking, when we are discussing about this. And here I wanted to say that considering how the European, how the European Union works, considering that the European Union is a club of states, I cannot imagine that uh, we won't face, we won't, we won't find a solution if one of these member states, in this case, in this case, Spain, uh, clearly manifests the political will to uh, have all the official languages that we have back home also official in the EU institutions. And in this regard, I agree that the main responsibility here is on the Spanish government side to make clear that they have the political will to um, add the Catalan as an official language, not only in Spain, but also in the EU institutions. These past few weeks, we had the opportunity to discuss this topic as part of the events that we organize around the Conference on the Future of Europe. The Conference on the Future of Europe allowed us to discuss 
all the main topics that the U European institutions put on the table, and we wanted to do that because if the topics are important for Europe, are important for Catalonia. And in these indeed eight roundtables that we organized around the Catalan territory, we wanted to include an extra topic. So we took all the topics suggested by the European Union and we added as an extra topic the uh, recognition of the Catalan language as an official language. And indeed, we had the opportunity to discuss this topic very actively with experts, civil society representatives, practitioners and decision makers that uh, sit together around this table to uh, provoke this debate that is truly, truly important. The motto that we use for participating into this, uh, in this conference on the future of Europe, it was precisely the future is Europe. Right, because I think that we all agree here that the future is Europe, that our future cannot be unfold outside Europe. And this is something that we repeated in all these roundtables that we did. We also said that the European roots that we have here back home in Catalonia go, you know, started much before the accession of Spain to the, at the time, European Economic Community in 1986. The full history of Catalonia is connected to the history of Europe. And in this sense, we really think, we truly believe that the future is Europe, as we said, as the motto of this conference. But we also want, uh, we want a project for Europe that is based in this diversity, that united us in this diversity. Indeed, as I said before, multilingualism is one of the rights that we want to defend and we want to work in all platforms po possible and uh, more precisely in the recognition of this official status of languages that are official in the territories that are part of the European Union. Indeed, we believe that the cornerstone of the European project is precisely growing this diversity and not also growing the diversity on a theoretical on a theoretical from a theoretical point of view but also building the institutional challenge the, the ch channels to to make this um, part of the policies and part of what we decide so i just wanted to say um sharing with all of you that uh, we are we are really really happy that the irish has the status that it deserves and we are very much looking forward that the catalan will too in a very short time frame Muchas gracias thank you very much it's really a pleasure and i'm really thankful to, thankful to be part of this conversation thank you very much minister consellera thank you very much Thank you very much. And let me say, David, Daisy, Peter, that we all are very happy because of uh, the uh, Irish language fully recognition at the EU level. But also that, as you mentioned, that uh, uh, the, the, the right of, uh, of the language is that the, the language right is a human right. Let me say also that uh, um, uh, I am asking myself, and I, f I find, we find a shame if we will have to fight more, if we will have to fight for a human right to be recognized, rather more or meantime, that we are fighting for, a, for the Catalan to be fully recognized uh, at uh, European Union level. That is very worrying. I'm very worried uh, since I, I, I heard you that saying that the, the, the language right is, is true. The language right is a human right uh, at the end. Okay. But anyway, thank you very much. Go, uh, thank you very much for, uh, to the opponents, uh, to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for the, all, the, all the followers. Uh, uh, online to this event and uh, so father na sa gaige so father na gaige I say well that <laughs> so thank you very much uh, once again and that uh, we are very happy we are very happy uh, because your language is fully recognized and I hope someday the Catalan will be also recognized okay thank you very much.